Hey there, YouTube. Brenda Petrella here. And Atticus. And Kaya, although you probably can't see her. <laughs> She's a black lab. Welcome to part three of my Milky Way series. Now, if you missed part one and part two, I will link them above as well as below. Part one, we talked about how to plan a Milky Way photo. And in that video, I go into a lot of depth about how to use the PhotoPills app to plan a Milky Way photography night. In part two, I talk about how to prepare your gear and yourself before you go out to do a whole night of night sky photography. In this video, part three, we are gonna actually go out and shoot the Milky Way together. I'm gonna be driving to a location that's about two hours away. It's called Willoughby Lake. It's a lake that runs north to south. And so when you're on the North Shore, you're looking down the lake to the southern sky, and that's where the Milky Way will be. And I actually scoped it out a week or two ago using my PhotoPills app, and I could see the exact time of night when the Milky Way was going to be coming down right over the middle of the lake. And there are these mountains that come down into the lake, sort of um, like a little canyon. So I just wanna briefly talk about clothing before we go out because we will be out all night and it can get cold and you don't wanna be caught cold out in the dark. So I always like to bring a couple of different layer options. I'm just wearing a quick dry t-shirt right now with some quick dry pants. They're both very light. Then I bring a light layer. This is from Outdoor Research and it's just a very thin layer with a little bit of down in the, in the central part. And actually this keeps me quite warm. And if I need a little bit more than that, then I always bring a down vest. I find that down vests really keep me warm. It really sort of blocks in that body heat and they're very, very compactable as you can see. On top of that, you've seen me wear this before and it's just a very light down layer, super compactable. You can stuff it into your pack and it weighs next to nothing. And then lastly, I'll have my, my winter hat just in case I really start to get cold and some light gloves. So let's talk about settings briefly. In Milky Way photography, our goal is to try to capture as much light from the stars as possible without introducing noise. So we're going to set our apertures wide open, the widest that they can go for the lens that we choose. So for my lens, for instance, I have an f1.8 lens. So I'm gonna set my aperture to f1.8. That's gonna be wide open. The next thing we're going to do is set the ISO settings. Now you want to really have high ISO settings, which is different than other types of landscape photography where you're always trying to use the lowest ISO setting as possible, usually around ISO 100. But for Milky Way photography, we still want to use the lowest ISO that's going to give us the highest quality image, but it's going to be much higher. So we're gonna start at about an ISO of 1600. Some cameras are really great at high ISO settings and can boost that up to 6400 or so. I never really go that far on my camera, which is a Nikon D810. I find that 1600 to about 2000 or a little higher is about as high as I'm comfortable going without introducing a whole lot of noise, especially if I'm just trying to get one image and not stack a bunch of images together. Okay, so lastly, let's talk about shutter speed. So there's this thing called the 500 rule. And basically it's, it's a guide. You take 500 and you divide it by the focal length of your lens. And that will give you the amount of time that you should leave your shutter open in order to capture the stars and not introduce star trails. You know, because, because the earth is moving, the stars appear to be moving across the sky. If you keep your shutter open for a really long time, you're going to start to see star trails. So you can use the 500 rule as a starting point. Now the 500 rule only applies to full frame sensors. If you want to use this on a crop sensor camera, you want to use a 330 rule. 330 divided by the focal length of your lens. Okay, so let's use my camera as an example. It's a full frame camera, so I'm gonna use the 500 rule. My lens is 24 millimeters, so I'm gonna do 500 divided by 24, and that equals around 20 seconds. So I know that my starting place tonight should be F 1.8, ISO 1600, and I'm gonna start at 20 second exposures, and I'm gonna see how it looks. And I might go a little longer, might go a little shorter, depending on how I adjust my ISO settings. I will never change the aperture setting for night sky photography. So a couple of other settings. One, I always shoot in raw format, especially for night sky photography. And the reason for that is because JPEGs are a compressed file. So it's throwing away some of the pixels in the image and some of the information in the image in order to compress that file down. And the camera is doing some in-camera processing of the image. 
and it's much better to process the images yourself using the RAW format. So I highly encourage you to try shooting in RAW, especially if you have access to a photo editing software program like Lightroom or Capture One or Luminar or something like that. So I always shoot in auto white balance because you can always change the white balance in post-processing if you're shooting in RAW. If you're not shooting in RAW, then you want to aim for around 3800 to 4800 Kelvin. That should give you the right color in the sky. An optional setting is to turn on long exposure noise reduction. What the camera does for this is that it basically takes a second image with the shutter closed. And so it sort of takes that as background noise and subtracts it from your final image. So that has some pros to it because it is basically attempting to get rid of some of that background noise that can occur in a night sky image. The downside of it is that it does take two photos and if you're using a shutter speed of 20 or 30 seconds you might be waiting for a long time and you can't do it when you're doing time lapse because it will prevent the time lapse from moving forward and you'll end up with a herky jerky sort of movement of the sky. Something to keep in mind is that it's always better to err on the side of overexposing a night sky image than underexposing an image. To bring out the shadows in a night sky image is is really difficult to do without introducing a lot of noise in the shadows or in the sky. So it's always better to overexpose a little bit and then bring it down. Okay, so let's talk about settings for time-lapse photography. First of all, like I said before, the long exposure noise reduction should be turned off. Secondly, you also want to turn off your playback function. So once you've already figured out what you want as your composition and you've taken a bunch of test shots and you're ready to go, then you want to turn off the playback function and that will help preserve your battery. So in a time lapse, you're basically taking a series of photos and then you stitch them together and make them into a movie. And so what you're doing essentially is you're taking one photo of a certain length of time, a certain length of shutter speed, there's gonna be an interval in of time in between that before it takes the next photo. If you're taking a time lapse of the night sky, you want to make sure that that interval in between the two frames is as short as possible. And so basically it's just enough time for your camera to write the file to the SD card and then move on to the next picture. This is different than if you were doing time lapse, say, of clouds, which sometimes are moving very slowly. In that case, you might want a longer interval in between the photos. So how do you figure out how long your time lapse should be and how many photos to take for that? Well, let's start at the beginning. So most time lapses are shot at 24 frames per second. That means I need 24 images of the Milky Way for every one second of video. Say we want to have a 10 second video at the end. That would be 10 seconds times 24 frames per second is equal to 240 frames. If I wanted a 20 second video, it would be 480 frames. So you just take the length of the time of the video you want to create and you multiply that by the frame rate, 24 frames per second. That will give you the total number of frames or images that you need to take during your time lapse. So let's say that that's what I want to do. Let's make a 10 second video at 24 frames per second. My shutter speed is going to be 20 seconds. And my interval, let's say it's going to be two seconds between each shot. So this total duration of time required to take one image is 20 plus two seconds, the shutter speed plus the interval. So 22 seconds. So now I take my 240 frames that are needed for my time lapse video and I multiply that by 22 seconds, and that is how much time it will take me to shoot the time lapse, which in this case is 88 minutes. Now, some cameras come with an intervalometer built in, mine does, and so you can set up these settings inside the camera itself. If you don't have that in your camera, then some shutter releases have it, where you can program it into your shutter release. So if you buy a shutter release that is also an intervalometer, then you'll be able to set up your camera so that you're not sitting there pressing the shutter button every 30 seconds. <laughs> you don't wanna do it that way. The other thing that some cameras have is the ability to close off the viewfinder. That just kind of cuts out any light that might be getting into the camera from any other way. It shouldn't be getting in anyway. it's just an extra precaution. Well, if for some reason I don't get to film the Milky Way tonight, it is because of this. We have ourselves a loose cow, actually steer. This is Ferdinand and he got out. 
he can be a little bit of an escape artist sometimes. So now we got to get him in. Come on, bud. Come on. Come on. Good boy. Come on. Yeah. That's a good boy. Good boy, buddy. Miss Bullvine. Everybody's back together. Yeah. When you're working in the dark, it's really important to know how to handle your camera, know where your buttons are, know how to change your battery, know how to switch out your SD card if you need to without moving the camera. Night photography is a great way to really dive in and know how to use your camera front to back. Okay, hey guys, here I am out on Lake Willoughby. I'm here with my camera, as you can see, using my red lamp because I don't want to interrupt the, the shooting. My camera is doing a time lapse right now. Unfortunately, I had to cut out a lot of the video that I was hoping to do because there was a huge party going on in the parking lot behind me. Um, there were a bunch of people who were, you know, having a good time dropping a lot of f-bombs and I didn't really feel like uh, talking over that so I went ahead and started the the time lapse I took a bunch of test shots and the settings that I ultimately decided on were f 1.8 um, ISO 2500 and six seconds this is the shortest shutter speed I've ever used I'm just trying to change things up and try something new usually I'm doing around 20 seconds at an ISO of 1600 so I'm trying to see if I get a lot of background noise with using the higher ISO or not. I'm also having some trouble with my intervalometer for some reason. It keeps shutting off after about 80 photos, which is a little frustrating. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm gonna come out with a time lapse from tonight. But the conditions, aside from the party and the noise and all of that, uh, are pretty good. I understand now why this shore on Lake Willoughby is not an often photographed spot for Milky Way photography. For one, there is a road right behind us, as you can see. And so there are a lot of cars coming and going, and so their headlights are often interrupting what I'm doing. So I've been trying to cover the area with my hat, but I'm not sure that's being super effective and people seem to really like hanging out in this parking lot. So I'm gonna go because more people are arriving. So the party came back <laughs> and ruined my time-lapse again, and now they're off. So we'll see. Um, I'm really hoping that by taking a time-lapse, I'll at least get one or two photos out of all of the hundreds that I'm taking. That would be good, at least as a still image. And I'll probably edit and stitch together the time-lapse anyway, just to see how it turns out. So we'll see. You know, this is what it's like being out here sometimes. Sometimes you just don't know what you're going to get. Okay, so admittedly last night did not go exactly as I had hoped. Unfortunately, there were a lot of cars coming and going and headlights going out over the lake, and so I was pretty disappointed. But I think it's a good example of in landscape photography and in night sky photography, even if you've planned and scouted and, and scoped out your location, unexpected things can happen and you just have to make the most of it. So if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't yet subscribed, please consider doing so and hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and follow me over on Instagram and make sure you check out my other videos. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot.